Gig Gab, the Working Musicians Podcast, episode 192 for Tuesday, December 4th, 2018. Thanks, folks, and welcome to Gig Gab, the podcast by, for, and about working musicians here in Durham, New Hampshire. I'm Dave Hamilton. Here in Los Gatos, California, it's Paul Kent. How are you doing today, Mr. Kent? Doing pretty good, Mr. Hamilton. How are you today? I'm good. I, actually, I have a little dilemma that I want to go through here, but, uh, you know, by and large, I'm, I'm, uh, I'm good. I'm good. Good. Uh, yeah, life is crazy our, this time of year. Uh, yeah, it really is. We had our... Um, the musicians holiday happy hour that I host. we had that last night, a great turnout, really fun people. I'm always uh, surprised. I get so many nice notes from people who really enjoy the event. And I, I'm surprised that it's, it, we're almost 200 people there. Wow. I'm surprised that it's uh, become a thing that people look forward to that much. I mean, it started out where it was just a little invitation amongst people I knew. Right. And then we kind of grew it. And like I said, 200 people and people really like it. They like the, you know, I get up and I give a toast and say, let's keep doing what we're doing. Um, uh, people look forward to this and, you know, the mixing and the networking and the making new friends and reconnecting with old friends. It's just turned into a really, really nice thing. It's kind of rewarding to kind of see this little community, you know, support each other this way. That's excellent, man. That's really rewarding. Yeah, I can see why. Nice. That's awesome. Wow. Yeah. So, that's cool. And this, yeah, is, so that's, this was the sixth year, seventh year you've done it, fifth year? Sixth year that we've done yeah, it. Okay. I found a picture from the first year and it was literally 15 of us, you know, sitting around a table having a drink. And now we take over a whole bar. And, um, you know, I, I know about a little more than half the people in the room. You know, I, I, when I put the invite out, I just say, as long as it's, you know, it's your bandmates, it's your sound person, it's your roadies, it's your lighting person, it's your booking person, music industry people good. Let's just keep the fans out of it for this one. Sure. So people can just relax and enjoy. And actually, that's the one thing I get more comments on than anything else. I mean, people like people like that it happens, but they really like that to the left of you and to the right of you is someone who is in the same boat as you. And that, that kind of makes that community kind of feel special. So yeah, it's a really good thing. Yeah, no, it's uh, well, it's like gig gab in person almost, right? That's that's uh, right. That's pretty good. I like it. Yeah, we actually, we had some gig gab fans that came up and said, "Where was gig gab today?" You know, yesterday, I, I, and that always blows me away that people are so in tune with our schedule. All around the world, we get people like, "Is everything okay? Everything all right?" I know. That's why I said it last week because we knew we were going to have to defer. I had a physical right. yesterday, so I had to go see Doctor Jellyfinger. But um, <laughs> <laughs> but uh, yeah, there you go. Uh, <laughs> so uh ho, so we ho, had ho. to delay ho 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 is right <laughs> yeah exactly um yeah so but i thought we told everybody and then uh you know but yes i i too got some comments so yeah it's interesting well we have all our stuff from uh but we have all the, the stuff about voice boxes and processing and all that to to talk about here but I have a dilemma and I, this is actually quite sincere and I'm, I'm going through this today. So it, it's good timing. I would have called you anyway. And it's the good news about this particular dilemma is it's my own dilemma. So I can, I can talk about it pretty freely here on the show without, uh, you know, kind of breaking any confidences or anything like that. So it's my confidences that I'm, I'm yeah. breaking. Yeah. So, um, you know, I like to do all these theater shows, right? And, uh, yes. and they've been fun. And, uh, and I've talked about how I'm sort of paring that down and, and only doing the shows where I really enjoy them. And, uh, and, you know, generally the shows where the band can interact with the cast are the ones that I really like. And so I've got one coming up that like checks all those boxes, right? End of December, um, uh, th there is a performance or several performances of uh, Hedwig and the Angry Inch. I think I mentioned it uh, happening at Seacoast Rep. And, uh, and, you know, for the last, whatever year, I've sort of had it penciled in on my calendar. Like, yep. Okay. We'll do this. It's four dates leads up to new year's Eve. Great. No problem. And a band is on stage for it. Like all those things, the fun music. Great. So I get the email yesterday, which is arguably quite a bit late, uh, for these things to like actually come together, the email with all the details and it's, Hey, cool. So uh, here's all the details and, you know, it was just like some logistic stuff or whatever. And uh, the the uh, 
performances, instead of being four performances, were now five performances. So instead of being four and two rehearsals, it's now five and two rehearsals. And then they say, and because we want, you know, we're having the band on stage, we want everybody to memorize the music. By the way, there's no charts. You're going to have to like figure out the parts for yourself from the recording. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. So that's extra time, right? And and this is really in is December. In December. <laughs> right. Yes. And this is my this is my dilemma. It's it's all time related. I'm going to talk a little bit about money in a, in a second, just to, to kind of put a, a little extra context on this. But truly, the problem is for me is time. So it, it went from four performances and two rehearsals to five performances and two rehearsals or two tech rehearsals, I should say. And then they said, so, you know, you got to basically here's the, the music, uh, y you know, here's the CD to listen to go chart things out for yourself, drummer Dave. And and then memorize it because we're going to be off book for this show. And because the band's so involved with the cast, we want to have a, like a band rehearsal, but then four rehearsals with the cast. Mm. So now we're talking, if you've been doing the math at home, the 12 days of Christmas that they're asking of Dave. And I, I did the math. I'm like, well, there's 28 days left in, in, you know, between now and the end of this run. And you want 12 of them. I don't know that I can do that. Like I, but I, how, I can't imagine you're the only person with these late changes that is going to have a problem with this in December. So I, is there, <laughs> is there safety in numbers here? Maybe, but also like, I, I'm not interested in it. Like it, I don't need safety in numbers for this, right? It's it. I know it's, it's pretty clear. It's pretty clear that I cannot commit enough of what they need. I mean, even if, and I've had some conversations with them and it's like, okay, well, what can you do? It's like, well, really, you know, even those six days that I was doing are a stretch for me. Right. You know, and now we definitely need more than those six, like at least two more than those six. And no, but it just sounds like, you know, terrible planning yes. to spring this on people. Welcome about a to December the theater commitment. world. Yes. Yeah, but I mean, I mean, they're the ones who end up short, right? If you're if you're planning this and you're going to expect people in December yeah. to miraculously create time, it just seems like a, a response to them of like, listen, we're going to have to split this up amongst two drummers is is absolutely warranted, reasonable. It, you know. it is, except like we would both need to be at more rehearsals than would make sense, and mm -hmm. on top of this, it and and again, it like. I could sort out the money thing with them. If it truly wasn't, if the schedule wasn't an issue or the schedule was deal, dealable, I could sort out the money. But I will say that the money for this was very surprising to me when, when that all came in yesterday. Normally we're paid per service. Uh, so rehearsals, a service, a, uh, a, a performance is a service, right? Everything's yeah. just a service. And, and at this theater, they don't pay very much. It's 50 bucks a service. So I was expecting six you know, services to rehearsals for performances. I was expecting that this was worth 300 bucks. Now it's 12. And they said, look, we're, we're not paying per service for this. We're paying a, a flat, what? a flat stipend of 200 bucks. Holy crap. Doesn't so this, exact, this does not sound like your dilemma, Dave. I, well, that's see, there you go. That that's kind of how I took it. As, but I, you know, I feel responsible here because I, you know, for the last year, we've all been planning to do this gig together and I know that they're counting on me. And I know that if I, if I tell them I don't have time to do what you now are telling me you need. But uh, what is, what is that old saying? Your, your lack of planning does not constitute an emergency on my part. <laughs> that's basically what it comes down to. And, and it, it really is like December's tough. Anyway, the business that I'm in with, you know, advertising, I mean, we are very much a Q4 business and, then we've got a big trade show in January with CES uh, that we need to do planning for. So I response. Yeah, could I carve out those 12 days? Yes. I mean, sure. Uh, it would be, uh, uh, you know, sacrificing other things. And I just responsibly just can't bring myself to sacrifice all of that. It, it would be sacrificing, uh, you know, a lot of work time, a lot of family time. I and cannot imagine you're the only person facing this issue. It's that, probably that true. But I, again, I don't need to know that. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like, I, I don't need to seek out, am I the only one? Do, are, is there safety in numbers? I think the safety is they, they've got whatever they've got. And I think I need to respectfully, you know, say, yeah, but this, this, this particular gig's not for me. That's kind of where I'm leaning. And I feel awful about it at, at some part, but I have to think about me first. 
and it sucks. But yeah, here I, am. I mean, I mean, th- there's no way that you know. Obviously, the money doesn't work. Sounds like you're actually you're being really nice about this. Sounds like they're they're being really kind of not cool about this. I mean, stretching the time commitment, lowering the pay commitment. I mean, those, those, yeah, yeah, those two things on the surface are like, yep, yeah, no, thank you. Right. And like I said. I, you know, I could work planning. out the time. I, I could work out the money. My my thought was, okay, there's no way, like, especially as someone that- that's you add here, the two things together at the same time, it's almost, it's almost an indignancy. It, it is. And, and you know, we sit here all the time and we talk about fair pay for gigs. So, uh, you know, the, there is a part of me, really, the, I, I want to say, if I could make the time work, I would find a way to make the money work. And it probably would be, look, it should be 600 bucks for 12 services or whatever, Give that to me in trade. My family, you know, we like to go to performances at this theater. So that way I'm not paying taxes on it. You're not paying any, you're not paying cash out. Just give me the 600 in trade and, you know, it's, it's fine. Right. Like that, that could be doable. Um, but, you know, I sit here every week and say fair pay for your performance. You got to stand up for yourself. And I know if I cut that deal, the other musicians didn't. So now yeah. I'm kind of supporting this thing of like Dave took care of Dave, but, and yeah, it is. I mean, it, in some level it's every man for himself and all that, but I, like, I don't feel right about that. Well, yeah. <laughs> and the thing that we've tickets, said is it's not a, it's not a charity. Right. Right. <laughs> yeah. And the thing that we've always said is it, as long as you're up front and everybody agrees up front, but it sounds like they, they've moved the goalposts here. And um, yeah, I just, yeah. this seems, this seems like a pretty easy one, Dave. I know, but it's not easy because I, because a part of me feels like I have a commitment to this and I totally, but they changed the commitment, not you. They changed the deal. Right. Right. You, yep. you were ready to honor the commitment that you made. Yep. And this is the second time this year that I've been in this position with a the theater, right? I had this problem with UNH uh, when they changed the deal with, uh, with the performance that I did for them in October. And I swallowed that. I actually wound up, wound up doing that show as a volunteer just to cut ties with the whole paperwork disrespect headache that I dealt with. Yeah, we with talked them. about that. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. But it's like, okay, wait a minute. Here I am again? No, 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 no. Yeah, and I, I think yeah. that welcome to the theater, I think that that is um – that's a codependency, my brother. That's, mm-hmm. you know, that's like, mm-hmm. that's allowing someone, you, you teach people how to treat you, right? I, absolutely. And I feel bad because so many of like the directors and so many of the people in the involved in the production are my friends that I do Madhouse with every mm-hmm. month or whatever, you know, whatever. It's seven times a year or something like that. And so I feel bad knowing that by me, by me saying it doesn't matter, right? They changed the deal. I am letting them down. I mean, I'm putting them in a position where now not, not only do they not have Dave, they probably don't have a plan B, you know, yeah. like that sucks, but I got to take care of me. So, so when we, when we tell them, uh, I'm going to, I'm going to let them know tonight. I, yeah. I asked him for 24 hours yesterday when I got the note and said, look, and, and explained what the issue was, you know, like this is a major change. I can't, I don't think it's, I don't think it's for me, but give, you know, give me 24 hours. If you need, if that's too much, call me and, and I, you know, I can make the decision sooner. I said, but I really want to cogitate about this before I, you know, before I make it, make up my mind. But changing the deal on three or four weeks notice, I think is the most. Oh, they want to have the first answer. rehearsal tomorrow. Ah, uh, yeah. Like, I can't, which I can't well, I mean, in, during which, the day too, which is like, no guys. Yeah. yeah. This is just, this schedule doesn't fit for me right now. In, in my life is really what it comes down to. The schedule they need doesn't fit into my life enough that, and they did, I got texts from the director or whatever. And he was like, you know, is there, you know, don't, don't, don't let the commitment stress you. It's like, well, but I am going to hold the performance back if I'm not there for, to, to get it prepared to the level that, that everybody else is prepared to do. And I look, they created like a little doodle schedule or whatever. And there were enough of the band members on there that were like able to check enough of the boxes that it's like, maybe there were, you know, that whole safety and numbers thing. Uh, maybe, maybe I am the odd man out. And that's like, it doesn't matter. It like, it only matters to me. So, you know, but you might, yeah. might want to just for uh, our listeners sake, explain what a doodle. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. So doodle.com is this awful service that is, the, <laughs> it, it is awful. And I can say that cause I created something better, but that got all tied up in lawsuits, unfortunately. So it, it will never see the light of day, but um, doodle is this awful service that you can go into and you put in a bunch of blocks of time 
and then have other people come and choose what blocks work for them. And then you can find sort of, you know, the, 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 the dates or slot time slots that work for everybody to get together. It actually, it, it serves the purpose of doing exactly what you would want to do in a scenario like this, which is, you know, lining up rehearsals and seeing who's available for what and finding critical mass for a meeting or whatever. But it's just, it's an awful way to do it. There's a much better way. Unfortunately, like I said, uh, it's created. Put it out there. Yeah. It's, it's out, out there. there. Yep. It's there. So there you go. Yeah, I think you, you have a pretty clean. Con- I guess I get the feeling bad because it's people that you've worked with before. But when someone moves the goalposts on you, you know that. I guess you just have to weigh that feeling bad versus the reality of of you know the totality of what's being asked of you, which That's clearly it. you have done. It's it's and, the uh, totality of it, right? It's yeah. yeah. It's like I'm going to feel a lot of pressure to to make even. Even, you know, eight of these work or or nine of these work, right? As opposed to even twelve, it's gonna it's gonna carve into my life in a way that's that's disruptive. And but if you I, had a club I, date that that you know you signed to do four four club dates and they said, Yeah, how about if we make it six and we're gonna give you less money, th- yeah. it wouldn't even dawn on you to say, No, thank you. Right, right. Now, right, the deal is torn up, so we're starting from scratch. And, right. um, and there you go. Yeah. And you'll, you'll be your usual diplomatic self and letting them know that the, the I, changing of the deal is just too more than you can handle. It's just more so, than I can deal with. Yeah, exactly. Right, right now, especially. Yeah. yeah. I wouldn't feel bad about it because you were ready to honor the commitment that you had with him. So that's, that's the thing. I was, I was. Yeah. I, you know, although in looking at it, it's like, oh, that, that actually is a lot, you know, but, but I, I would have, it's just, it's too much. And I, you know, yeah. So there you yeah, go. I wouldn't yeah. feel bad on this. I mean, I get, I get that, that you feel bad, but I think you have a right to, you have more than the right. You're letting me the off right the position. hook. Yeah. I, I don't think there's not a hook to be, you know, they, they created the hook. Yeah. So yeah. It's a new hook. That's the problem. It's a new hook. Yeah. Yeah. No, I think you're good, man. Yeah. I mean, Thank you. No, Thank no you. fun to disappoint people, but yeah, of right. course. And I, and I got to do Madhouse with them on a week from tomorrow. Right. I mean, and not, I have to, I want to, I'm looking forward to doing Madhouse with them a week from tomorrow, but there's, sure. it's going to be weird. Like, cause they're going to be like, Oh, Hey, cool. Hey. But we'll have this conversation. I, like it's fine. That's fine. I, Awkward conversations are something I'm actually that aren't really all that awkward to me. You know, it's probably like <laughs> it's probably like you. You know, you just get used to it as, as you go through life. You have to have these things, and the simpler thing is to just look somebody in the eye and have it, as opposed to avoiding it and all that stuff. So, yep. yeah, yeah, sucks though. <sighs> so there you go. Yeah. So check it out. I took a gamble this year. I did not take any club dates for uh december we were offered all the standard clubs we do want us to do a december one i did not take any club dates and um and we did not get any corporate christmas parties this year which we usually have at least one and um but what i've heard is like i don't know anyone in my area like the south bay area the the san francisco area seems like those bands have got their share of work but we didn't get a single christmas party this year did any of your bands get one uptown uh, no, Uptown, like I said, Uptown isn't with Gary's new restaurant. Uptown is, is booked very sporadically. So no, we don't have any Christmas parties with Fling or Uptown. Fling did have a New Year's Eve gig that was sort of floating out there. Um, I basically declined it because, because of this, you know, this uh, yeah. Hedwig thing. Um, but, uh, it, it turned out, I, I think our keyboard player also couldn't do it. So I, you know, it was like a done deal. But um, yeah, no, Fling Fling doesn't have anything until we've got actually got a big party we're playing on January twelfth uh, for a, 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 a big thing that's happening. So we're looking forward to that. But yeah, no, I'm 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 pretty light on gigs this month. Well, actually, that's not true. I have on Friday night I'm playing a uh, uh, acoustic gig with Monkey Fist, so that should be fun. Yeah, yeah. So I was just surprised, and you know, this is the thing to my mind is. You go back and you replay the, is having something in hand better than, you know, waiting for something. Mm. I know last summer, you know, all the summers that I've been booking when we play a lot, I will take it and I will fill up the calendar figuring sp- scarcity is your friend. But this year I was keenly aware of the, of the, like, you know, within 60 day offers to play things that were pretty good money that I just didn't have any time for. And so I, in booking next summer, I was actually careful we're almost booked up with what I was going to take publicly, but I've left a couple holes, you know, for, for late breaking things. You're always playing that game, you know, yes. is something in hand better. And, you know, the, my thought was that there's a point where the axis is crossed. And when you 
the likeliness of something coming in those last 60 days becomes greater the more kind of exposure your band has. Sure. And I thought, but it didn't work out for me this Christmas. <laughs> so, I mean, so who, what the heck do we, what heck do I know? Right. Yeah. Yeah. That's interesting. Yeah. It, it's how it goes, right? It's, um, it is how it goes. You have to, you have to take that risk. And, and th- I mean, that's sort of the, the, uh, the way it goes, taking those kinds of risks is you can't overthink the outcome based on just one of these. You have to kind of look at, well, what have I more always data. done? Yeah. More data. Yeah. What have I always done? Has it worked out? Do I need to make a change? Don't just take the most recent piece of data. Certainly it might be more relevant. You, you know, the, the 2018 data might be more, more relevant than the 2008 data, but you, you know, you got to look and are there trends? Is this just, is this just how it worked out? And I don't need to worry about it. Is it an anomaly? And you don't know until you have more data. So, yeah. Yeah. I really, I, I want to get my friend Dan Meblin on here. He runs a band called Livewire out of San Francisco. That's oh, yeah. You've really them, fantastic. Yeah. Dan's a great guy and he's, he's runs a great band. Clearly it's his livelihood and he takes it very seriously and he goes and he gets good work for his band, you know, quite a bit of it. And I, you know, as much, I know what I don't do, right. I don't, I don't organize myself to find, you know, all the HR departments in, in the area and, and, you know, just as I would market anything else, go find who the buyer is, go let them know about you, try and get appointments with them, talk, you know, do those types of things. I don't do a lot of that, but I don't know if that's what those people do. I mean, I would think that that's what it is. Right. Yeah. So, you know, go where the customers are. That just kind of makes sense. But, you know, I'm then the other side of it is I'm like, oh, those guys, man, their phone must be ringing off the hook. They're so much better than us. Well, they are better at attracting bookings right now than you. And that could be luck of the draw. It could be that they're making more phone calls, right? It could be that they're a better band, but probably not that, you, you know, so rarely. <laughs> well, just the reality is so rarely is it the talent and product that actually rises to the top in, in a scenario like this. It's the people that are, you know, out there hustling and trying to get the work right. You, you know, if they're, if they're good and if, if, if every if every band, I mean, we're talking about it with brands, but it you know, could be homogenized to any product. But if every band is at least good enough to, you know, entertain a crowd for three hours, nobody cares beyond that. Right. I mean, like yeah. the people in the positions of choosing the band don't care. I, your audience may or may not care. You on stage certainly care. Right. But the reality is like th- that, that th- the amount of care. Uh, decreases as the further you get from the stage. <laughs> yeah. You know? No, so, I agree. Yeah. It, it, I don't, it's not a talent thing, but no, uh, it's not it's, a talent uh, thing. Right. Right. But what it is, is a, is a belief thing. So if people have heard, Oh, that's a great corporate band. I need to get them for my, you know, what, what, whatever the talent is, if they believe that the band's vibe, the band's look, the yep. band's demo, you know, creates that opportunity. That's uh, that's 70% of the battle. Probably. I think so. Maybe, maybe, yeah, somewhere between 40 and 70%, right? You need to have that, but just having that isn't going to get you gigs. You need to like you need to make yourself accessible. And part of making yourself accessible is calling and, you know, being friendly and working the phones or the email or whatever your shtick is and like I don't, you know, I don't, it's I don't. Well, it's all dizzying cuz you know the, the house rockers sold about 700 20 dollar tickets. In, in within two weeks of two di- for two different shows, right? Sure. Yeah, I consider that pretty good. And, you know, That's pretty good. Yeah, pretty damn good, right? And so I'm thinking we we're here, we're at that point. But you're always kind of reminded that you. And again, I don't do enough of that direct marketing to likely decision makers for that corporate work, and that's sure. that's really what it is. It's not just having a Facebook page or having a having a website. It you've got to go get that business. It's not going to come to you. That's right. Um, and so, you know, I certainly have can be doing more along those lines, but um, but yeah, uh, if you build it, they they will not likely come. That's that's true. I think that's probably the safe way to say that. Yeah. Yeah. yeah so talking about these these ticket sales, so like I said, we had a, a stretch two shows in October where we just you know that's people awesome. were willing to pay a lot of money to come see us, and then um, I so you kind of get into that flow that this is like not a bad business model. I have three ticketed shows in the first month of the year next year. I've got a house rocker show. I've got a show that I'm doing 
Oh, oh, I have a, um, I'm doing my petty tribute the week after the house rocker show. Yep. And then a week after that, uh, Mary Ellen, Steve and I are doing a tribute show. So those are, and the only reason there, so it's a house rocker, it's a pickup band doing petty. And then it's my acoustic madness band, but they're all ticketed shows. And so the dilemma in front of me is, you know, how do I kind of wait the promotional thing, because I don't know if I'm going to get people, you know, even though I may have some people who like what I do, I don't think I, they like me enough to go three weeks in a row <laughs> to three different things I'm doing. Right. Yeah, yeah, so yeah. it's a little bit of like, Oh, I kind of got myself into this. So now I got to figure out how to kind of separate the marketing. Sure. So the petty one, the petty I, one is you pretty know, easy. Hang on one second. I, I want to hear about this, but uh, as I'm sure other audio uh, freaks like me are hearing, your mic is occasionally overmodulating. So I'm going to pause things. We're going to fix that. And then, uh, and then we'll come back and hear about this petty thing. So uh, cool. give me one. All right. I didn't even need to go past one. It was just one. And I got us out and fixed it. I think we fixed it, but uh, now tell us about petty. If you would, please. All right. So the, you know, the petty gig is um, that has a wider appeal. That's people who like petty and that's who bought it last year. Sure. So I think that one's cool. The house rocker one is the house rocker audience. Um, and then the acoustic madness, you know, it's me, Steve and Mary Ellen each go into our audiences right. to sell tickets for that one. That one is, well, you know, all of them have their own kind of pressures with the venue to, you know, since we're getting the door yeah, or, right. or a good percentage of the ticket price. So, but it's three gigs in three weeks that I got to sell tickets to. That's a lot. Wow. It is a lot. Yeah. That's, I mean, but that's no different than what a touring band deals with on a nightly basis, right? They're renting but it's out three different, three yeah, different cities, three different cities. Right. That's correct. That's, that's right. Whereas I, you get I'm, to work one audience. Geography. Yeah. No, that's why bands tour. That's why you can make money touring. If, if you do all the other things and the promotion and all that stuff. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. It's interesting. All right. Uh, should we dig into this vocal stomp box thing, yeah. man? Okay, so uh, back in show 190, so two weeks ago, two weeks in a day, if we're being accurate, uh, I ranted a little bit about having to deal with some of these vocal stomp boxes at a gig where I was uh, not only playing uh, for one of the sets, but also running sound for the other. And as you might remember, I, you know, I was just complaining that do they do any good? Uh, they certainly mess with gain structure. They, they over compress the sound from, from what I was seeing on the EQ and also hearing changing the, the EQ and all that stuff. So I want to read some of your comments and then, um, I want to share some thoughts that I've had. So we'll go in uh, some particular order. Uh, we'll start with Sean who wrote in and said, uh, I play in a cover band in San Antonio called Zero Gravity. Uh, we play mostly rock and some dance songs. We use the, vo the Voice Live 2, TC Helicon, same manufacturer, uh, Voice Live 2 pedal on our lead singer for special effects and harmonies. We don't really use it to make his voice sound better. Instead, we use it for distorted sounds like on Sabotage by the Beastie Boys or for a tin can kind of sound all treble in certain spots on songs, kind of that megaphone sort of thing, uh, or for songs that have short vocal echoes and delays in certain spots. Also, Daft Punk has some songs where they use an auto-tune vocoder type sound in the vocals. And for example, the intro to 24K Magic by Bruno Mars. So it works out well for that kind of stuff that I would categorize as special effects rather than vocal conditions. We also use it to throw in some harmonies, and even though the voice live harmonies do sound very fake by themselves, they blend in just fine with a loud rock band and don't sound fake at all. They sound just fine. Uh, so that's Sean's note. I have things to say about that, but I, I want to read George's note uh, as well. And uh, who George had some comments on our on our post uh, at giggabpodcast.com. And George says, I like our TC Helicon mic mechanics, which is another box from TC Helicon. He says, all of our singers have one, but this applies to any vocal uh, stomp effect. You have to set them right for sure. Correct gain, not too much effect, etc. But they can add a nice, subtle general effect with adaptive tone EQ or for certain songs, add more color like delay and distortion, as Sean was saying. That said, uh, we don't use the pitch correction or for what I think are obvious reasons. And we use extra harmonies so subtly you wouldn't be able to pick them out. Mostly, he says, I'd like the fact that I'm in control of how my vocal instrument sounds. When I talk to the audience, I can turn off the effects and I can switch to a more different effect for ballads or even get creative using multiple, multiple effects within a single song. 
Would you want some sound guy you hardly know adjusting the effects uh, or tone on your guitar? Why wouldn't the same be true for vocals? As vocalists, he says, it seems to me that we should care what the end result sounds like uh, and take at least some ownership over it, in my opinion. The same applies to owning your own mic and using good in-ears. It all equates to applying craft to your performance. So this and when we had some back and forth and you can actually go to the post uh, and and see some of the back and forth that I've had with with George on this. And I've I've it, it, the, these perspectives have been uh, interesting to me. So I, I like the idea that a vocalist or a band on stage can control when the effects are on or off. That is usually something that the sound person likes to control. Um, or is used to controlling, I should say. So expect this to be a change if you bring one of these and you and approach it diplomatically, right? With your with your sound engineer. Um, the the big problem though is the gain structure. You know, I when I'm doing sound, I'm very used to being able to control every aspect of that. I know I have a mic plugged into a cable, plugged into a you know a, a preamp on the mixer, and then I can adjust gain. I can adjust compression. I can adjust, you know, EQ. And then of course at the end, the overall level, and I can blend in effects after the gain. When you have one of these boxes, uh, you don't have that control at the soundboard anymore, right? You lose that control. And that I think is the crux of where I have a problem with these things is that, you know, you basically are getting, it, it's almost, almost like getting a tape recorder signal, right? You, whatever was recorded to that tape, you can't take out the, the EQ changes that were made. You can't take out the reverb that was added. That's all there. So you can't blend the same reverb for all four singers. You can't blend the same delay. You can't apply the same EQ. Everything's coming in pre-processed in a big way. And you also can't control gain. So if you're not getting enough gain out of the mic into the preamp, that's not there for the sound person to control on the fly. So, but I'd like the idea of uh, like, uh, like Sean and George and, and a couple of others have kind of sold me on the concept of, right. You know, like you would with your guitar, Paul, you have effects, effects for the sake of effects are not necessarily bad. Effects for the sake of effects are not necessarily bad. It's the, the, in order to accommodate that you're now changing where the gain happens. And that's what got me to thinking like, okay, you know, when fling plays now, I don't do anything with gain. And the reason is we have a digital mixer, as I've said, we figured it out in the studio. And then over time live, you know, we make some tweaks and I know, and I've, in fact, I can recall a setting on the board that says, okay, look, if it's Dave singing into this mic, great. I know that the gain should be set on this mixer at, you know, 32 dB or negative 32 dB or no plus plus 32, uh, it, you know, and, and it's all automatically set and Burke on that mic. Great. Plug them into the same channel. It's fine. It's good to go. And so I don't change any of that stuff. It's pre set. Why couldn't it be preset with the addition of a vocal box instead of doing all the gain on the mixer. Why not do some on the vocal box, just split the job and then leave whatever's left uh, on the mixer. So you're doing far more on one of these vocal boxes. And I think that's where the frustration has come in is it's like, Oh, cool. We're at a gig. Let's do it on the fly. And it should not be done on the fly. I think that's where a big problem uh, comes in. And that's where I really ran into an issue. Burke's box. Burke has one. He's our bass player in Fling. His actually worked fine for that gig. We haven't yet, but we will, sat down and really worked with the gain. But we've used it enough live that we've sort of on the fly figured it out. And it's it's better. Whereas the folks in the other band showed up and I had no idea. I had no idea how they had set theirs. I'd never, like Burke and I have had long conversations about gain structure. I've never had conversations with gain structure in this other band. So I have no yeah. idea what they were set to, right? So you have to really think about it holistically. And I, I'm saying this for myself too, but, but also, you know, from, as a, a, from a sound engineering standpoint, but as a singer, if you're going to show up with one of these things, you have to... It really, you probably shouldn't show up with one of these things without having a conversation and preparing the engineer that that this is how that's going to work. Just like you wouldn't show you just, when you send your stage plot like this. This should be a yeah. a, a preset conversation. Yeah. And more importantly, you should you need 
to know how your box works. And if you don't understand gain structure, you need to learn it before you show up at a gig with one of these boxes. Right. So for our audience, let's just have a common understanding. Gain structure Mm -hmm. is getting all inputs to their most efficient state before for clipping. I, I like that. Yeah. I mean, there's so much more we could talk about there, but that is a great like crystallization of what gain structure means. Yes. Right. Yep. And, uh, but you know, a few thoughts here. So, you know, we run into this problem with gain structure with wireless mics often. Oh, that's a huge. So, so this whole concept of, of, uh, accountability for gain structure, it is already distributed between the band and the, and the sound guy. And if it's a, and again, sure. your, your, your situation, if it's your sound guy versus another sound guy. So certainly what George's comment is makes a lot of sense is that yep. you walk into a room where they insist on providing the sound guy. He doesn't know your show. He doesn't know your set. He doesn't know where the effects go. And, uh, you know, it makes more sense. And so that analogy to someone, uh, you know, a guitar player's foot pedals, that that actually, if you think about it, that makes a lot of sense. It is a fixable thing. Um, what I don't know from my perspective is like, d- you know, do you care whether all singers have the same reverb added I've, onto their... I've always thought I cared about that. It, like, the, the, when you're in the studio and you're mixing vocals, it can be really nice to get everybody feeding, not just on the same reverb patch, but literally feeding into the same reverb unit so that they all sound like they're together. In fact, I'm going to give you a little secret of podcasting that I learned and started using about 12 years ago. This show has some reverb on it. You don't hear it, but if I took it away, you would notice that you and I aren't in the same room. But I uh, feed us both into the same reverb unit so that when we wind up talking Yeah, when we wind up talking over each other just like we did there, there's just this touch, touch of reverb that makes us sound like we're in the same room. It really helps. Yeah. So, so because of that, I feel like it matters live. Honestly, it probably doesn't, but I feel like it does. <laughs> so there you go. Well, in certain situations, might like if you have a section of background singers and your your need is for them to be fairly homogenized, that then that makes a lot of sense. That's fair. I think I think a good place to back up on this conversation is this: vocals are the most important thing happening. They are the thing that people will connect to with your band. They are they are the thing that will get you work. You know, assuming you're yeah. you're a vocal group, right? Right. Um, these boxes, just like guitar effect pedals, are extremely novel right out of the box. Something different happens that is uh, often th- interpreted as cool. You know, to hear a harmony where there was no harmony before, to hear compression, to hear, you know, a, you know, a set bunch of EQs where they, that didn't exist before is novel. And the temptation is to say it's all good, especially if you're not... Uh, if you're not uh, familiar with with sound physics and you're not familiar, you know, with mixing, right? Right. You you right. buy one of these boxes, 100, 200, 300 bucks, and you plug them in and you hear something that the difference, just the difference being there often is perceived as good, valuable, and useful. Maybe it is, maybe it's not. But then the issue is that some of these boxes, you know, like TC is a really fine manufacturer. Yeah. There are other ones that are less quality. And, you know, all of a sudden what might sound good when it was just you playing with your microphone in your garage, once you try to, you know, broaden that out with a, with a bigger sound system, it, it can do a lot of unexpected things to you and not understanding the dynamics of sound mixing um, is, is a large part. Why? So that, that interesting harmony that you thought was a, a, a nice, you know, subtle addition um, might disappear entirely or over overcome your lead vocal right. if the box is not used right. So I, I think there's, you know, so, yeah, because it's um, uh, Will in his note wrote in and says he purchased a TC Helicon pedal and it immediately picked a fight with the tone match in his Bose S1 Pro. And he says that that you know when we talked about having that sonic blob of all that extra compression, he's like yeah. that 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 put a label on it for me. He said so, but but that's two different things. Like the the Bose has its tone match, TC Helicon has their whatever it's called, the Active EQ or uh, whatever that whatever that thing is, and uh, 
and it makes it, you know, like you get two well, the, things the electrons fighting the battle. Swift, right. Yeah. yeah. The, the, the initial electron of your voice, <laughs> you know, going into the microphone that's supposed to come out at another end. It's, you're doing a lot of stuff to it between point A and point B. That's it's being it. processed by a few different things. How well do those things play together is what the question is. Yeah. And you really, you know, from a sound standpoint. So now if I'm thinking about it, like, OK, let's assume that this vocal box has some redeeming quality or some additive quality to the sound. Right. And. Of course, that can be changed depending on how you have it set. But it, with that assumption, it's like, OK, let's do a bunch of the processing there. Let's let it do what it does and dumb down, for lack of a better term, what we're doing on the on the mixing console. Right. You know, like, OK, cool. We've got the gain taken care of there. So but it really has to be taken care of there. And I think that's part of it is trusting. OK, is that right? Great. Now let's adjust it here. And finding the effects that work, just like you would with your guitar, you know, finding, okay, this sounds great in my living room. This sounds great in headphones. Does it work live? Maybe the compression should be turned off on the on the vocal box or dialed back a little bit so that the vocal, vocals can punch a little more live or whatever that is. But finding that out and then making sure, to your point, Paul, that you're not doubling up on these things and causing, you know, just unfixable sonic mess is, is what well, and the problem to. is if you're in a different room every night and it's not your sound system every night, it's a different set of problems. That's and the problem. Th yes. th where the analogy with the guitar breaks down is in general, the guitar player is going through his amp every night and controlling the, the signal from, from input to output. That's right. And usually uh, sometimes you, you'll get a line out from the back of the amp, but other times you just put a mic in front of the amp and that yeah. gives the engineer some level of control. I still, maintain that guitar players need to listen to the room and adjust at the very least EQ on an amp and sometimes reverb levels, depending on, you know, what a room sounds like, but, um, I, and vocalists need to do that too, right? It's the more wiki wacky boxes, the more gear you add, the more you need to think about what, what they mean in any given room, especially if you, if you're inheriting, responsibility for a not insignificant part of your sound. Right. You know, I think it was, it was Sean or uh, no, it was George who said, you know, wouldn't you want to have some control? Well, I like that idea. Some people might not want the responsibility of that control. Well, that's just, it. Once right? you get the control, you have the responsibility. Right. That's it. With great power, right. Comes great <laughs> responsibility. But that's what we're talking about here is you have to own that. So if you're going to have one of these things, you now need to be an expert on your portion of it, whatever your portion is. And maybe your portion is, I bring my microphone because I know this works. And if you know that, great. But also be open to the idea that your mic might not work as a vocal mic in every room. You know, you might like singing into a condenser mic. Well, if you're in a room with a, a short stage with a metal ceiling, that ain't going to fly. You're just going to have feedback all night. Y you know, you might need a dynamic mic that has a little bit tighter pattern or something like that. And you need to listen to the engineer who knows the room or is learning the room to, uh, to work that stuff out. So yeah, it's, it's crazy, but, but it has opened my mind. In fact, I'm very much looking forward to, you know, learning more about Burke's box and, and figuring out how that works and how we can integrate it. And maybe we'll get to the end and, and I'll be right back where I started from. But, um, but I've got an open mind on this. Like I, I see, I see where the benefit could be. Um, I especially like being able to turn off, you know, reverb and, uh, and delay or whatever effects when you're talking with the audience and then, you know, have them on and have it a little wetter when, you know, when you're singing or whatever. So it's interesting. Um, one last, are, are we, are we good with that? I have one last comment from Keith, but it's, it's sort of a, a, a tangential comment. So I didn't want right. to. Yeah. So, Keith writes and he says, uh, I have something slightly related to this conversation. I'm a sax player and I tastefully and sparingly use a TC Helicon Harmony M harmonizer to turn my sax into a horn section on smaller gigs. He says I leech a MIDI, a MIDI signal off of the keyboard player and my pedal builds harmonies accordingly, dynamically in real time. Many options available for harmonies in five memory settings. It sounds good in the mix, and I never use it when I'm soloing. I think it's helped me get more gigs than other horn players when the budget only allows for one horn. On the gigs without a keyboard player, I can set it to octave doubler, where it duplicates my note an octave above or below or both. 
Um, so it, that's an interesting thing, right? Where, but he sounds like at some level, he's an expert on this thing, right? He's figured yeah. out how to make it work. He knows not to try and have it do anything other than octaves. If he doesn't have a tonal reference coming via MIDI from the keyboard player, right? Like he knows exactly what to do and it helps him get gigs. So it's, I, I like this that. is an interesting situation because, um, this is a question about how much is too much and what's good for live music and what's real and what's, you know, so, yep. so uh, I have a great friend who's an amazing singer and she uh, often plays to track. So she recorded a bunch of MIDI tracks, you know, basically a band in a box and she'll have a guitar player play with her. So they'll leave it. They, they'll mute or leave out guitar parts. It'll be live guitar, live vocals, harmony vocals, and then, and then basically a band in a box. Sure. Is that good? Is that any better than than a DJ? Does it matter? Is it, really kind of an interesting question. Say, say, and it maps to this horn section. So he gets the gigs, and he can say, "I'm one guy, but I can make it sound like a like a horn section." The technology's there. Sure. You know, we have we have the technology. Yes, Steve, um, Steve Austin is is, <laughs> yes. is is with us. Yep. Um, is should it? Does it matter? I guess is the question. I mean, again, are we all? Is this just all? increments on the path to to dj dumb like why not just you know huh. why go through all the stuff if it's not real live music should it be does it not matter if it's what the customer wants is it is it is it does it damage the art does it enhance the art i mean you could actually say there's something really interesting to one guy sounding like a horn section but is is that any different than autocorrect right Auto tune. Auto tune. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Auto correct us. Yeah, yeah, that's yeah, different. yeah. Yeah. Well, I like I have this conversation when we do madhouses, right? Because uh, Brandon, our our half of the Mad Men, uh, really like he'll listen to a tune and he'll hear things in the song, and he's like, "Oh, we have to have you know that little banjo part or that little percussive thing," and. And so we will wind up playing along to tracks in order to include that stuff. And I always wonder, like in the house, does anybody actually hear that with a rock band playing? Like, it, like where is that blended? Is it worth the, the, the risk of having to play live to a track, especially for something like Madhouse, which is under rehearsed and it, the, the chances of the singer getting out of sync with the track and not knowing it because they can't hear the track is great, you know? And so I, I always like the challenge of playing along with the track. So I'm not against it. It's, it's kind of fun. And, and I like the click because the click lets me know I'm playing it in the tempo that the singers used to, especially with a tune that I've maybe have only played once or twice before in rehearsal, you know, that kind of thing is great, but it, I've always wondered like, is it worth it? How much is too much? And so you know, I'm yeah. It's, good. it's a good philosophical question. Yeah. Like I, said, I, I, I tend with my. And does uh, the audience care? Like my guess is the answer is no, but you know, who knows? But th that, that is the question though. I mean, I, so I play solo acoustic and I tend to shy away from, from even looping or anything like that. Yep. Um, but I've seen people do it and I think, and, and it can be cool. I play my trio. It's pretty much three voices and two guitars. Um, it's a very, it's a very natural. What is being played is what you hear is what is what you consume. Yep. House rockers are pretty much like that. Although I guess, you know, you go down the route of saying, well, as soon as you put an effect in front of a guitar, it's not that anymore. As soon as you put a patch on a keyboard, you know, you're changing the sound. So there's really no, no philosophical limit that you can put onto that process. You can do whatever you want. Right. I don't know. If, yeah. If, are you, if you're muffling your drums, like, is that now artificial? I mean, you know, depending on what heads you use, like there, there is a point at which you say, well, that's just, you got to like make your instrument sound the way you want it to sound. Like, <laughs> you know, there, there's a line there, but I get what you're saying. I'm, but I, you got to play in tune. You got to play the right notes. You know, yep. you got to, you know, I think that, that, that that's the core of, of performing live music, right? One would hope. One would, One would hope. hope. <laughs> Sometimes, though, does again, it comes back to, does the audience know? Like, how many times have you been watching a band or something and they, you know, they're just like, the harmonies are just like grotesquely out of tune. And everybody in the audience, other than you, is all smile or other than me. I don't want to put anything on you. But, I, you know, for me, it's like I'm doing my very best not to cringe, you know, and show that I know how bad it is. But um, but you look around and everybody's happy. It's like, huh? Well, and, you know, even for me, 
I, for whatever reason, recently I've gotten back into listening to a lot of live REM from the early eighties. And thank you to Gary, our, our listener who provides me with lots of links to these things. You rock. They just came out with that, that uh, BBC box set, like yeah. seven discs or something, right? Yeah. I haven't, I haven't checked that out yet, but, um, but I, but I've been, you know, back, like I found some recordings from the early, like 83, 84 and like they were that band had the ability to just pour emotion out. Like the vocals are all just stream of consciousness, right? Uh -huh. No one, no one knows what he's singing. It's mostly <laughs> out of tune. The tempos are all over the place, changing throughout the songs. The harmonies occasionally lock in, but usually you could tell they just couldn't hear each other, but still the energy in that performance is like, Oh yeah, I like this better than the studio version. So, you know, like there, there's, there's, enjoyment in art delivered in all ways, but it, it really does come down to does the audience know? And what does the mm. audience like? You know? Well, I, I would tweak this and say, does your audience know? That's so it. Yes. people who go to see REM, they're going for that raw emotion. And you you know, maybe I'm answering my other question is like, you use whatever tools are at your disposal to create an emotion and you put it out there. Yep. And uh, it, is it, is it working for you? I guess is the question. So whether, yeah, I, I mean, that's art, right? The, that's you know, everyone's definition of what art is, is, is going to be a little bit different. It's a little bit different. You got it. Yeah. Yeah. So I'm curious. I'm, it, it will not surprise me if a year or maybe even three months from now, I, I have not only come to accept these vocal boxes, but that I'm using one for myself. So I, I'll be, of course, as always, transparent about, about that process, but it'll be ironic not all that surprising. I'm, I'm used to changing my mind. I'm used to the way I change my mind, but, but you know, you know it'll be funny to go back and listen to, you know, show 190 and then maybe show 210 or something if, if things change by then. So we'll, I'll keep you posted, of course. So, yeah. It's fun to see all that, all that chatter about this one topic people yep. really got into and for sure. sharing their opinions about it. It was cool. Yeah. Thank And thank you everybody. Feedback at giggabpodcast.com is where you can send all that stuff to. Uh, and we, as we said, as Paul said last time, we'll make, uh, we'll make gear a more regular part of this. And, um, you know, to, to, to balance the ranting about, uh, bad scheduling and, you know, all that other stuff. <laughs> So there you go. So Dave, I think we should get back to um, getting guests on. The, I've had a lot of people ask to be, we've been talking about doing an episode about uh, the female lead person's perspective on being in a band and performing in a band. Um, I met two really, really interesting women at this mixer last night and they've started with, they're, they're calling it a community. So in, they live in the Monterey, California area. Okay. Um, and uh, they, they coalesce artists and audiences, right? And you kind of join this community and the community says, we're going over here and we've got a, a night of music lined up for you. And it's this, you know, a, a non-traditional approach to building a music scene in a community, I guess. And, and I don't know how, you know, you have the two essential elements. You've got artists and you've got, you know, consumers. Right. But, um, but what they do is they, they kind of like, the message is the same for both. And you can either participate in these gatherings as an artist, or you can participate as a, as a music lover. And it's Ooh. just kind of cool. And so they've asked about, you know, coming on and you know, I'm sure they would be interesting as well. Oh, that'd be great. You, know, you and I both have some more band people who want to come on. Yeah. Our buddy, Robert Berry, you know, has, um, has put out some new music uh, in tribute to Keith Emerson, finished a bunch of Keith Emerson's. So we had Robert on a couple of years ago and it was a great interview. And uh, he's continued to kind of like do really remarkable things. Um, and he's in the process. The reason I bring Robert up is he put out this music and it's been very, very well received critically. Um, and now here's a guy who, you know, has had great, uh, experiences in the professional music industry, trying to figure out how he can put together a tour, uh, to support this music. It's a little bit niche, you know, it's, you know, prog rock, you know, so, you, you know, where could he play? And he's going through the process of talking to managers and tour managers and figuring out if he can put something together. So I, I thought Robert would be another get oh, him back for another. Great to get him back. Yeah. on. Yeah. That'd be awesome. So cool. Yeah. I mean, I mean, I love you and we could talk all day, every day, but I think it's like kind of fun. We should go back to when we, when we bring somebody else in every now yeah. and again. Yeah, for sure. For sure. All right. We'll cool. work on it. Okay. Sounds good. Folks, if you have any guests that you think would be good for the show, email us. If you know them, introduce us. If you don't know them, that's okay, too. We're we're not afraid to ask people to come on the show. So, you know, just send us your ideas. We'd love to hear about it. Again, feedback at getgabpodcast.com. I think that's, uh, that's what we got for today, right? Yeah? All good, man. All good. 
Well, wish me luck informing these people later today. Oh, yeah. It's we'll hear about fun. it next week, right? Yeah. I, th- I mean, I think you've heard what you need to hear, but yeah, it's uh, just kind of Take a breath. Yep, exactly. Hey, when you go talk to them, just remember, always be performing. Thanks, man. <laughs> See you next week. 